The setting for this case is Staleybridge in Cheshire, once at the heart of the industrial north. On a hill outside the town stood Gorse Hall, a fine place with magnificent views, but in 1909, it was the scene of a savage crime when the master there was killed. It remains unsolved today. And what makes it particularly intriguing is that the victim, one George Harry Storrs, apparently knew he was going to be murdered. Stores died from his wounds soon after. The police arrived, and the hunt for the mystery killer, or the hard assassin, duly began. I'd like you please to tell me what you said in the police station when you saw the defendant. There were two trials, which soon attracted widespread national coverage. First accused was Cornelius Howard, George Harry's cousin. Second was a local man, Mark Wilde, seen here being tried for his life. Oddly, both men had the same defence lawyer, the remarkable Edward Theophilus Nelson, one of the first West Indians called to the English bar. That one. But they were by no means the only suspects with motive and opportunity, even if they were the only ones the police cared to pursue. George Harry's wife looked every inch the stricken widow, dressed in deepest mourning. But what was the real story of her marriage? His elder brother received the news of George Harry's death remarkably easily. His greatest friend was rumored to have fallen out with George Harry in the months leading up to his murder, while his wife could barely bring herself to say his name. The case duly collapsed. There were to be no more trials. It was clear that George Harry's death would go unavenged. His assassin had simply disappeared into that misty night. Oh, you're 
the second son of William Storrs, a brilliant local businessman, but he was the only one to inherit the father's passion for commerce, and it was probably in recognition of this that when George Harry married in 1891, William gave him Gorse Hall as a wedding present. From here, there was a magnificent view of Staley Bridge and of the Aqueduct Mill, the heart of George Harry's empire when Cotton was still king. It was also here, five years before the events you've just witnessed, that George Harry embarked on his greatest, and as it would turn out, final professional gamble. What do you think? I think that I've just had a ride in a time machine. <laughs> Robert, this is the revolution. Are you all right, sir? <laughs> of course I'm all right, and don't you two have any work to do? Uh, what all? You will get a motor car as soon as you can, won't you? I wish I could, sir. <laughs> Eliza? I'd marry one if it was legal. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. See? So, are you going to keep it then? No, no, I don't want to buy one. I want to make them. And if I can't, then I shall invest in somebody who can. Hello, James. I didn't know you were coming. I was in the Liberal Club. I thought I said he'd seen the car arrive, but I'd come up and take a look. Robert? I wouldn't if I were you. Hands covered in grease. Come inside and clean up. No, 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 no. I'll let you and James get on. Robert? See you tonight. Looking forward to it. I hear you from the bottom of the driveway. Well, this town could do with a wake-up. George Harry was no grad grind. He was always more interested in the future than the past, and he'd already expanded into building and manufacturing. But he did have one great sorrow. The marriage to Maggie Middleton, his older and socially superior wife, had produced no children. Hello, James. You had a turn in the motor car? I have no intention of going anywhere near it. How are the children? Well, thank you. James, his eldest son, inherited the main estate as well as more of the business than some thought he deserved. But the real source of tension within the family was that he and his wife had nine children when Maggie was barren. Just excuse me, James. I'm sure you and George Harry would like to talk. Well, well the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> I'm uh, a little embarrassed. I'd be pleased to buy some of your shares. I don't want to sell my shares. I well, we don't see what else we can do. I hesitate to suggest this, James, but you could always work. Aunt Margaret, will you...? Uncle James! <laughs> How lovely to see you. Uh, your aunt went upstairs, I think. I'll run and find her. I want some advice on a new dress, and it's no good asking you. It is not. <laughs> Marion's in good form. I dread to think what the house will be like without her. She's a nice girl. But I hope you remember she's not blood, George Harry. If you mean by that that I have no child of my own, nobody knows that better than I do. I don't suppose you want my advice about this motor car idea. Perhaps you'll let me give you some advice. Stick to what you know and don't meddle in things that you don't understand. It'll make us both richer in the long run. It depends. The blue makes you look more serious than the rose. <laughs> then without question, I shall have the rose. <gasps> The last thing I want is for a man to think me serious. Anything less likely to result in a proposal, I cannot imagine. You don't have a very high opinion of men. Oh, I think men fun-loving creatures, it's true. But I don't dislike them for it. Don't you agree, Uncle George? I think we do love fun on the whole, yes. <laughs> I was just on my way out. Enjoy your evening. Give them my regards. I will. I have the name, thank you, of the agent in America. Well, that's good. We must write to him. If my workforce can manage cotton, then they can certainly make wheels or engine parts. And what does James think? Oh, you know James. He'd love to drive a motor car, but work to make it happen. Yes. A talent for business doesn't always run in families. Worse luck. What about his sons? Would they be any good, do you think? Are you suggesting that I should borrow my brother's sons to make up for the lack of my own? I shan't dignify that with an answer. Heavens! Sounds like pistols at dawn. Bags up all the horses. 
Meanwhile, to get your strength up for the test, come and have some dinner. Robert Innes was George Harris' solicitor, and it was through the Innes's that he first met Maggie. They were part of that higher social set that he aimed at by his marriage. They lived comfortably, and their children were looked after by a governess, Maria Hole, whom by this time George Harry knew well. The children are almost fluent in German and French. Mama. That's very impressive. Most Swiss people speak at least two languages. Oh, dear. I can hardly manage one. <laughs> Maria wants to take them home with her next time she visits. Let them have some real practice. Mm. There's nothing more important than travel. You should travel. Might do you good to get away for a bit. No, oh, he hasn't got time for travel. Not now. Why? George Harry's about to embark upon his next great adventure. I'm thinking of manufacturing motor cars. It seems strange not to travel so you can make motor cars if the motor car's going to change travel forever. Do you think so? I know, sir. The motor car's going to shrink the world. I do hope not. Sounds rather uncomfortable. <laughs> I'd really love to see Switzerland. I have a picture postcard's true. Is it all snow-capped mountains and houses like cuckoo clock? A little. But most of all, it feels very big. With nature all around, so you can really breathe. As opposed to Staley Bridge, which just makes you cough. I know it sounds silly, but I do miss the views. That's not quite fair. You should see the views at Gorse Hall. Why not? You could come and visit. With a bit of a garden there that you might like to walk in. Well, she'd be company for Marion. Marion is my wife's niece. She's a jolly girl. You like her. Yes, yeah, she is. Jolly. That's a very good word for Marion. Maria Hull was a pastor's daughter. She was well-educated and bright, but the role of governess was more or less the only one open to a middle-class woman with no income, and it was never easy. She might dine with her employers. She might even be quite well-treated but she remained awkwardly poised between the family and the servants and not really part of either group. See you tomorrow. George, what are you doing? Miss Hall. I hope you don't mind that... Not at all. The children have gone to visit their aunt. I don't issue invitations unless I mean them. I can't remember the name of it in English. Oh, I haven't the first idea, I'm afraid. <laughs> Your English is so good, I envy that. If I did travel, I could never make myself understood, and it's not the same. But speaking a foreign language is strange. You know it, but you are a different person when you speak it. How do you mean? I think here, when I speak English, I'm very serious. I am a governess, and I sound like a governess. I can hear myself. I left school at 13. We hadn't got to languages. Well, for someone who left school at 13, you seem to have done quite a lot with your life. I must go. They'll be wondering what's become of me. I hope we shall meet again. Perhaps on one of your walks, Miss Hall.
Dinner's nearly ready. I'll be there in a minute. Did you see anyone today? No. Nope. Nobody out of the ordinary. Would you like to look at these? They're my first thoughts on the motor car venture. I wouldn't know what to make of them. Whenever you're ready. Good morning, Uncle George. Good morning. Can I get you anything else, sir? No, thank you, Eliza. Are you all right, Uncle George? You should have been a botanist. And why not? You don't know my parents, Mr. Storrs. For them, a lady botanist is only one step up from a suffragette. <laughs> do you miss your family? Of course I do. No, of course about it for me, I'm afraid. I don't think I'd miss mine very much. Well, I do miss them. Especially my youngest brother, John, my baby. Why do you call him that? It's how I think of him. My mother had nine children, Mr. Storrs. And there's a limit to what one person can do. So I used to look after him when we were younger. He trained me for my job, really. Now, when I'm lonely, he's the one I miss most. He once said that when you spoke English, you didn't feel like your true self. Yes. I was wondering, do you feel like your true self when you talk to me? Because I certainly feel like my true self when I talk to you. In fact, I don't think I felt more like myself in 20 years, and I shouldn't like you to be alone. Must be delayed at work. Oh, I expect so. Though why he couldn't have sent a message? That's very pretty. Is it a cushion? It's a kneeler for the church. Oh, how splendid. Well, I really think I should get going. Emma will be wondering what's happened to me. I'll let him know that you were here. Uh, I'm sure there's a reason. Don't worry about it. Tell him I wait to hear from him, and I'll see myself out. I'm afraid I've let you down. I've let myself down. You don't want to hear this, but... I can't be sorry. How can I be sorry when I can't ever remember feeling happy? What you've done was stupid, I know. Then tell me that it made you unhappy and I'll not try to see you again. Just tell me that. And I'll leave you alone. I can't. Now, of course, the situation was hopeless guilt-ridden for Maria, dangerous for George Harry. But the fact remains they were deeply in love, perhaps for the first time in either of their lives. What was that governess doing here the other day? Hmm. What governess? The Swiss woman who works for the Innesses. She was walking in the gardens down by the cops a couple of days ago. I don't know anything about it. 
I told her she could come and walk here if she wanted to. Hmm. You should have said. I didn't think it was important. She was talking about missing her home and the views and such like, so I asked her to come and walk here. Why? Have you any objections? Of course not. Heaven knows it costs enough to keep it all going. I suppose even you won't mind if somebody enjoys it once in a while. I don't think anybody... I'm going to the mill. Remember James is coming this evening? I know. Only you forgot Robert was here. George Harry may have been putting his work and his whole position in Staleybridge at risk, but their mutual infatuation was beyond their control, and the relationship drifted on over the coming weeks. I was wondering, if I managed to get away for a few days, do you think you could find an excuse to join me? I could go to Germany, because I should see the Mercedes plant anyway, and, and then you could go to Switzerland. I think the most sensible thing we can do is just enjoy being here together. The point of making plans if we have no future. Oh, if it were only myself that I had to worry about. And what about me? Running away with a married man? I couldn't do that to my parents. I couldn't do it to the innocent. I wouldn't do it to myself. No. This is as much as we will ever have. It has already been so wonderful that I know I will be punished. Are you listening to me? There's no point in my beating about the bush. The share price is falling, and I believe it reflects this newfangled idea of yours about motor cars. James, let me stop you right there. I don't see why. I am a partner in the firm. I have a right. What right? Don't think because you've inherited shares you can come in here and threaten me with some absurd notion you picked up in your club. I will not be spoken to like this. All right, then why don't I just leave the business for you to run? You wouldn't do that. Oh, no. As a matter of fact, I have been thinking that I might sell my shares and move abroad for a while. Maybe stay there, make a new life for myself. Oh, be ridiculous. You couldn't do that. What about Maggie? She would have to make a new life, too. There you are. How did you get on? Not too badly. I found the gloves and ordered the boots. And what about that? I'd be caught dead in. I'll tell you what I did here. Do you remember that Swiss governess to the Innes children? The one who used to come and walk here? Yes. Well, apparently, she's leaving to go and study at Oxford. Can you imagine anything more odd? I disagree. Why shouldn't a woman have a decent education? Oh, I think it's wonderful news. Don't you? Yes, I suppose so wasn't possible in my day. But then so much has changed. Who did you get his family? No! no. George! We didn't expect you. I'm sorry to push in like this, but I remembered something I should have told Robert about the hospital contract. Well, never mind that now. Can we persuade you to some dinner? Are you sure? Of course. Come sit next to me, Henry, and move down a little. Well, come on. There we are. We were just talking about whether we should give in to the children and get a dog. And of course, everyone knows it's going to be Emma and I that can have to look after the thing. No, it wouldn't. I hear you're going to Oxford, Miss Hall. Yes, that's right. This all seems rather sudden. She's only just decided, and we were quite surprised, too. When are you leaving? In a few days. She's just like you, George. When she makes her mind up, that's it. But I do hope that we shall meet again on one of your walks before you go. I don't think she'll have the time, will you, Maria? There's such a lot to do. Well, I am sorry to hear that. That is, I'm sure that everybody here will miss you. Well, we certainly shall. And I hope that you will miss Staleybridge. Just a bit. 
more than you know. This grave is stone cold. Annie. Women undergraduates were still a novelty. My own great aunt was allowed to attend university lectures in the 1890s, but only if she sat no exams and was accompanied at all times by a maid. Even so, there were women's colleges. Women's votes, women's rights were topical. Maria's decision wasn't so extraordinary. It's the suddenness of it that's hard to account for. Perhaps Emma Innes thought it was time for her to make a clean break. With unfortunate timing, it was at this moment that George Harry's cousin, Cornelius Howard, emerged from the woodwork, hand held out in search of a favour. But if it's Uncle George's cousin, why don't we know him? He's been serving in India for years. Is he an officer? Non-commissioned. And he's out of the army now. He is quite nice looking. And his father was a butcher. Uncle George's brother was a butcher. His aunt's husband was a butcher. <sighs> And as far as I'm aware, it's not yet a crime. This sort of disparity in families wasn't unusual in the highly mobile world of the late Victorians. William Storrs had founded a fortune. His sister married a pork butcher. As a result, their sons were born under very different stars. Cornelius Howard drifted into the army after a career as a petty criminal. He made bombardier, but he left the army shortly after the death of his father. He saw Cousin George as his one link to rank and money, and he meant to make serious use of him. I'd love to go to India. How do you know you'd like it? <laughs> well, it's got to be more interesting than Staley Bridge. Well, I don't know. There are some things about Staley Bridge that interest me very much. We've got a visitor. Cousin George. Cousin James suggested I pay you a visit. You're most welcome. Aunt Maggie, I wonder if I could drag you away for a minute. There's something upstairs I want to show you. Of course. Your niece is charming. She's my wife's niece. Oh. So you've left the army then? Yes. And what are you going to do now? I hoped you might be able to give me some advice. Advice or help? I don't have much family, Cousin George, especially now my father's dead. Of course, you don't know me, but... You worked in your father's shop, didn't you? Yes. Well, what's wrong with that? Everyone has to eat. Maybe, but... Well, I'd like to try some other business, and Cousin James said... What do you know about business? I can do accounts. I was battery pay sergeant for the Royal Field Artillery. Well, that should serve you well round here. There are plenty of new companies who might need an accountant. It's a boom time. Is there any possibility? Couldn't you find something for me, Cousin George? I'm afraid I don't care to mix family with business. I hear Denton's uh, expanding into new premises. Perhaps they'll need a wages clerk. But I've run a whole administrative unit. And it'll not take you too long to move up, will it? You must come back and tell us how you get along. Elijah! Mr Howard is leaving. Good luck with your search. Cornelius Howard was living on sixpence a day. His father had left the princely sum of £32 to his daughter. George Harry's refusal to help may well have been simply because he neither liked nor trusted his cousin. History would prove him right. But even so, it's no wonder that Cornelius should have been enraged by it. As the months passed, George Harry must have prayed that Maria might return to Staley Bridge as suddenly as she had departed.
Maria. What's going on? I'm ever so sorry, Master. I know you. You used to work here on the roof and you gave up your job. If I did, that's enough of your impertinence. And how dare you to come here! And how dare you! How dare you! What's all this, then? The 11th of August. The wedding anniversary, Uncle George. Is it? <laughs> what happens now? Well, you blow out the candles and cut the cake and we all eat it. What <laughs> 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 oh, a feat. A candle for every year you've been married. Oh. <laughs> what the devil? I'll go, sir. Where's Mr. Stores? He's not available. It's all right, Eliza. I'll see to this. Thank you, Eliza. What can I do for you? You can give my girl a job back. That's what you can do, you arrogant bastard. She's gone her work and she's had to move away. And all because of you. I dismissed Kate Kenworthy because she was unfit for decent society. What do you know about decent society? What did you say? I'll make you sorry for what you've done. Go on, clear off now before I send for the police. I'm not scared of you, you bully. Uncle! I'll make you sorry you were born. In January 1907, eight months after she'd left, Maria Hole came back to Staleybridge. Her return was as unexpected as her departure. But she would pay no more visits to Gorse Hall, and there is no evidence that the wretched George Harry received any explanation as to why she wouldn't see him. More alone than he'd ever been, George Harry retreated into a world of his own. The lovers would never meet again. On the evening of the 7th of February, 1907, Maria Hole sat down to write her final goodbyes. Do not expect me back tonight. Nobody is to blame, only myself. It is heartrending to leave you all. Please console my poor parents and accept the heartfelt thanks of a miserable sinner. Marion, you made me jump. I didn't hear you come in. I ran into one of the Innesy servants in town. Maria Hall has gone missing. For three weeks, Maria's whereabouts remained a mystery, until one evening, Robert Innes paid his friend a visit. Won't you come in? Uh, no, thank you. I require a quick word with George. Robert? What is it? They found Maria's body in the river. And they're sure. <laughs> Emma identified her. And they have performed a post-mortem. Is this... I do not wish to discuss it. I wanted you to know the facts. That's all. Or rather, you to know that we now know. You'll understand you're not welcome at the funeral. Robert. Or at my house. Goodbye.
Maria Hole was laid to rest in the Innes family vault. The verdict of the inquest was that she had taken her own life in a fit of insanity, which comfortably obviated the need to investigate her depression. We can only guess at the feelings of those around her. Robert Innes soon quarreled with George Harry, but as for Maria's father, we can't say exactly what he knew, only that his grief was terrible. Later, he would bring his family to England on a pilgrimage to visit the place where his beloved daughter met her end. Pastor Hall. Who wants him? My name is Storrs, George Harry Storrs. Got him, him. I knew your sister. We are aware of who you are, Mr. Storrs. Will you please leave us? George Harry, what the hell do you think you're doing? I just wanted to. Mr. Storrs, you've done enough. Did you see who brought this? I didn't see. Thank you, Mary. The letter must have struck George Harry like the knell of doom. Terrified for his life, but trapped inside a web of his own secrets, he seems to have felt there was only one person he could safely confide in. His devoted servant, James Worrell. What did they want? This was delivered. My God. When did it arrive? Sometime yesterday. What did they say? They need more information. <laughs> That's ridiculous. He said that people who write letters like this have no intention of carrying out any threat. They just want to frighten you. Well, I should think they've done that all right. Can't they offer some protection? To reassure his master, Worrell agreed to make regular patrols of the grounds at Gorse Hall. What are you doing here? This is private property, and we don't tolerate poaching. Around this time, there were reported sightings of strangers in the area. A fact that Worrell decided to keep from George Harry, presumably in a misguided attempt to protect him. Did you see who left this? No, sorry. should happen, I shouldn't like you to think that I don't appreciate everything that you've ever done for me. Everything but make you happy. That isn't your fault. Anyway, nothing's going to happen. Hand me my shawl, will you? Why don't you ask a friend to come and stay? I'm not so much of the time. You must be lonely. Oh, I've got Marion. Not always, and she has her own life these days. Why don't you invite Georgina MacDonald to come and visit just for a few days? You do like her, don't you? Of course. Well, then that's settled. I'll see you downstairs. What do you mean, sir? That you're being watched. I do. I get this feeling sometimes that there's somebody following close behind me, keeping just out of sight. Sounds quite mad, I know. I'll double my patrol time, sir. No, 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 I can't ask that of you. You can ask anything of me, Master. You know that. People, 
praise the quiet of the country, but I never find it so. And those noises are so disagreeable. When you think of those animals and all the machinery and so on. You don't have many pictures, do you? You like it plain. I suppose we do. Where's Marion staying? Oh, just with some friends. Not far away. I hope you know them. Oh, yes. Because these days I find that young people seem to have forgotten how to behave. <coughs> <coughs> You're not well, Mr Stores. That's quite a nasty cough. Have you got anything for it? It's nothing. That's what my mother said, God rest her soul, and she was dead as a doornail ten hours later. I'll be right as rain in a couple of days. What is it, George? There's somebody in the garden. Hands up! All right, Joe! What the devil? <laughs> ah! What's that noise? Eliza, don't get one of them. Yes, sir. Should she be doing that? It's all right, he's gone. I heard him run off. You all right, Mrs. MacDonald? Thanks to this curious incident, the authorities were finally persuaded to listen. It was agreed that constables would patrol the grounds at night, and as an extra precaution, a bell was installed on the roof to be rung in times of danger. Whatever the police might make of the threats, it was clear that George Harry was taking them very seriously indeed. I thought I'd run a test. Well, you never said. I was scared witless. Well, that's the whole point of a test, isn't it? Gentlemen, I'm very impressed with the speed of your response. Happily for me, this was a false alarm. George Harry's false alarm was long remembered in Staley Bridge. One child describing years later how he felt he had been woken by the clappers of doom. It was probably self-defeating. Three days later, all the constables were needed to protect the polls of a local election. And perhaps in revenge for this pointless exercise, or for whatever reason, the senior officer decided not to warn the stores that there would be no one available to patrol Gorse Hall that night.
He's asking for Mrs. Stores. She won't stop ringing the bell. He's asking for you. What he say? Help me take her to my room. I can't breathe. If only I'd been here. If only I'd been here. George Harry Stores died less than an hour after abandoning his game of patience. There was a flurry of rumour and suspicion. An inquest at Gorse Hall on the 8th of November excited local interest and George Harry's funeral the following day brought out huge crowds. And in the midst of it all, the crime claimed another victim. James Worrell hanged himself three days after the burial of his master. He left no note. So the question remains, who did kill George Harry Storrs? At the time, of course, people wondered about Worrell's motive for suicide, but whatever that was, he had no motive for murder. Plus an unbreakable alibi from the local publican on the evening of the crime. He did work with knives and guns, and he hadn't an alibi for that curious earlier attack, but we'll come to that later. I think he blamed himself for George Harry's death. As he knew more than any other, the degree of danger his employer was in. My God. Cornelius Howard was the first real suspect. He was a trained soldier, he had a grudge against his cousin, his alibi was dubious, and the maids identified him. But what had he to gain? If James were running the business, he might have had a better chance of a job, but it's a pretty thin motive to risk a noose for. Some people thought Maggie or James might have employed him as a hitman, but I don't think so. Whatever we might think about Cornelius Howard, there wasn't the evidence to convict him. Mark Wilde was next up. He was clearly pretty odd. Some months after George Harry's death, he mounted an unprovoked and savage attack on a young couple. And after his arrest, the maids once more identified him as George Harry's assassin. I call Eliza Cooper. Like Howard, Wilde had also had a spell in the army. And although his mother tried to provide an alibi for the night of the attack, it seemed to many that the case against him was compelling. Miss Cooper, I'd like you please to tell me what you said in the police station when you saw the defendant. Don't be afraid, just say how you described him at the station. I said he looked more like the attacker than the other gentleman. Which other gentleman? That one. So, when you saw Mr. Wilde, you thought he looked more like the man who attacked Mr. Storrs than Mr. Howard, the man you had previously identified. In other words, you have positively sworn that two quite different men were the murderer. Well, yes, I suppose I have. <laughs> Thank you, madam. Not very surprisingly, the second trial, like the first, collapsed. Of course, to this day, many people favour Wilde for the crime. His mood swings may have been symptoms of syphilis. His face bore the scars of it, and he was unquestionably violent. Me, sorry you were born! But his history was to run away from the sea, not stay to kill. And besides, what motive did he have? Beyond an anger at George Harry for spoiling his relationship with the mill worker, Kate Kenworthy. You come here, I'm dying you! It's not enough to swing for. What about James Storrs? Could he have hired an assassin? Are you listening to me? There's no point Whilst their relationship was at best cool, James never showed any desire to run the family business. He simply wanted to live off the profits that George Harry had worked so hard for. Why don't I just leave the business for you to run, then? The truth is, James had nothing to gain from the death of his brother. 
So who was the murderer? George Harris Storrs was in a loveless, childless marriage when he met and I think quite genuinely fell in love with Maria Hole. But any future together was impossible. Perhaps it was the very hopelessness of their situation which made them lovers, with its attendant risks of conception. I hear you're going to Oxford, Miss Hall. Yes, that's right. I would say without any question that Maria went to Oxford to give birth. Her time there bore no relation to the academic year, and the length of her stay, eight months, could hardly be more suggestive. It's my belief that George Harry knew nothing about it. I think he loved Maria deeply. I think he would have wanted to take care of her. And the child, a child for which, after all, he'd always longed. So my guess is that Emma Innes managed the details. I think she'll have the time, will you, Maria? There's such a lot to do. She allowed Maria to come back to her house, so that does mark her as generous, but it wouldn't have occurred to her to let Maria keep the baby. Abortion would have been ruled out as too dangerous once the usual methods of hot baths and gin had failed, but for Maria to bring up her own child, it wouldn't even have been considered. Postnatal depression, the surrender of her baby, despair over her lost love. These more than account for her death in the icy midnight waters, poor creature. And, they have performed. and the autopsy will have recorded that the dead woman had given birth. Where George Harry learned the truth, his decency and his love meant that he was filled not just with a sense of crushing guilt, but seemingly with a belief that sooner or later he would have to pay for what he'd done, that the birth of the child would lead to his death. It did. It will also lead us to his killer. Who then knew about the baby? Well, Robert and Emma Innes must have, and clearly they were angry. But murderers? They might have wished their former friend ill, but they were no more likely to hire a killer to dispatch him than I am. Maggie had much more motive. The failed marriage, the affair with all the betrayal and lies that goes with it. And then the news comes that Maria's given birth when Maggie's own marriage had founded on her barrenness. Could that have tipped her over the edge? That she knew about the affair, and probably the baby, is the only possible explanation for her refusal to see him at the end. She would not hear George Harry's dying confession. I'm asking for you! <laughs> but he said... She chose to miss her husband's deathbed rather than risk her good name. Is that the choice of a killer? Hardly. When the first anonymous letter arrived, George Harry sensed at once that the threat was real because he felt that the crime was great. The second letter comes, his terror grows, but he has a difficulty. How is he to convince the police or his wife that he's in grave danger without revealing his secret? Let's look at that first strange attack. A man pushes the barrel of a gun through the glass, and what does George Harry do? He runs to the window and he pulls down the blind. Then he sends a maid out in the dark to fetch help. And finally, he's insisted that Maggie has a friend to stay, so that for the first time in ages, there's an outsider in the house to witness these events. I believe the answer is simple. The man outside was James Worrell. And the whole thing was staged solely to persuade the police to take the situation seriously. It works. The police are alerted, the bell is installed. But then George Harry's nerve fails him, and probably fatally, he decides to test his plan. The bell is rung, the police come running. But when they leave, they take their goodwill with them. At last, the expected killer does turn up. And he picks a night when the police are busy with the local elections. But what were George Harry's feelings when he heard those words? Now I've got you. Now I've got you. No! Any idea that this was a random killing vanishes right there. It was George Harry he had come to kill, just as George Harry had known and feared he would. Oh, 
While I have no doubt that Maria Holt's suicide was the motive, obviously one has to guess a bit as to the exact identity of her avenger. But we know that in her own family, her favorite, her treasured darling, was her younger brother, John Gottfried Hull, and I believe he was the murderer. After all, he had to grow up watching his father lose everything, his family disintegrate, and all because Maria had met a man called George Harry Storrs. You have done enough. What are you doing here? I am fairly sure that John Gottfried came to Gorse Hall intent on vengeance. George Harry could not perhaps have identified his murderer, but he could have told them why he was dying, and he chose not to. The reason for his silence? Well, I suspect that as he was lying there, he thought about his beloved Maria, and he felt he deserved it. There was one survivor. Marion Lindley was Maggie's heiress, and much to James's fury, I'm sure, she eventually inherited George Harry's fortune. As a wife and mother, she lived a long and happy life. But the case had cast a dark shadow over them all. A year after the murder, Maggie had Gorse Hall torn down. In grief, in anger, in remorse, who can say? It's in ruins still. A melancholy memorial to a personal tragedy.